give you salvation just to possess it. You and I are to become the Christians God saved us to become. say that every rooster will crow over his own barnyard and uh, I'm that way when it comes to military missions. Years ago I heard somebody question whether it was a real mission field. It's on a foreign field. You've got to deal with a foreign culture. You've not only got to deal with a foreign culture but you've also got to deal with a military culture. You deal with a foreign economy. Uh, you've got to learn the customs of the people that you deal with. But most important, there are people there that if they do not hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, they'll never have the chance to receive him and be saved. I beg you in Jesus' name, Consider, consider, keep your heart open for those of you that do not know exactly where God wants you. Keep your heart open for military missions. If there's ever been a unique mission field, it is a unique mission field. Many times we do not go to the peoples of the world. However, we are starting churches and other places and we have a mission outreach we believe that mission churches ought to be mission minded we have the privilege of joining hands with 106 missionaries all over the world some of them have come through the doors of this college and gone on to the mission field it's unique in many ways. We only have them just a short period of time, most of them. So I look as our church as a boot camp. They come there and we teach them boot camp, basics. Study your Bible, pray, go soul winning. How to have a good marriage, how to raise your children. And then we send them out to other places. I have preachers calling me from all over America thanking me for the people that we have sent them. I, I maybe will tell you a little bit more about it on Wednesday. But I want you to think about this. Brother Sexton and I were talking yesterday that most mission, fee, mission uh, presentations close with a picture of the setting sun depicting time is short. Here's a girl sitting over here. Her daddy and mama are two of the greatest missionaries I have the privilege to know, Bob Holder, Germany. Just a few weeks ago, their community bid farewell to five of their citizens because they were killed in action. The United States military missions is the only mission field in the world where its mission target, people are trying to kill them. And we need somebody to reach them before it's too late. We need somebody to train our soldiers to go to the battlefield and win people to the Lord on the battlefield. Uh, when the shots are being fired, when the mortars are coming in, 
people think real seriously about eternity. By God's grace, we'll try to win them to the Lord and train them. But not only that, we have the privilege to serve in our host nation. I will glorify God in this, but Ryan River Baptist Church, a military church, probably sees more Germans baptized than any Baptist church in Germany. And it's just simply because we stay after it. Not only reaching the military, but reaching Germans. You can look out in our congregation and on any given Sunday, there will be 12 to 14 different nationalities because our men marry Filipinos and they marry Koreans and they marry people of other nationalities. And so we win them to the Lord and they go back to their country, maybe for vacation or maybe for a visit. And they tell their relatives about it and other people get saved. I think it was one of the most wonderful things in the world that an Angolan guy led to the Lord by a Caribbean. Caribbean. One day a lady came forward she had visited in our church a couple of times and she had a, another lady with her that was sobbing. And the lady said in broken English, this is my mother. She only speaks Portuguese, but God has moved her today and somebody needs to talk to her about the Lord. The Caribbean guy won the, uh, won the Angolan guy to the Lord. The Angolan spoke Portuguese. The Portuguese guy came and he led the, led the lady to the Lord. I don't believe you can find that in many places, but I will tell you that it's tremendously, tremendously needed. Somebody asked sometime, uh, Brother Lancaster, does it take somebody who has been in the military to be a military missionary? The answer is no, it doesn't. The man who has pastored the largest military church on foreign field was an old Kentucky boy that had never spent one day in the military. It takes a few things. It takes commitment. It takes loving people. It takes a servant's spirit. It takes a desire to win people to Christ. Uh, and yes, uh, it, it, some of the single ladies might say, is there a place for single ladies in military ministry? Oh yeah. I mean, there are all kinds of, there's all kinds of work that needs to be done church planting. Right now, as you sit here, there are two military bases in Romania and they're just saying, come and help us. There is no missionary there now. If I had a young couple that would go with me today, I think I would cancel my part of the meeting on Wednesday and fly with you back to Germany and then travel over to Romania and say, let's get started right now. It's one of the most exciting opportunities that I've ever seen in my life. It reminds me of what Ryan River used to be 20 years ago when the base was just bustling with people. It's a great, great opportunity. Not only to reach the military, but to reach the Romanians in the community. We have two families from our church. One is already in Romania and another is raising their support to go to Romania and work with us in coordination of Romanians and military. If you have not settled it in your heart, would you pray, God, if it be your will, show me, Lord. He may show you the United States military. We don't want you to come to Germany on a vacation, but if you're seriously interested in working with the United States military, I'd like to invite you to come as a summer intern. Spend a summer with us there. Spend a few weeks with us there. We'll put you in some of the most exciting places that you've ever been. 
you'll have the joy of witnessing and telling people about the Lord and winning people to Christ. And you'll have the opportunity to meet some of the greatest Americans that you'll ever meet. And great Americans that need people to love them. Some of you young people that are already, some of you young ladies that are already cultivating a mother's heart. Mrs. Lancaster many, many times has stood at the bedside and held the hand of a mother as she bears her baby because mom could not come all the way from the States. I'm an old crotchety guy sometimes, but I know you probably couldn't picture me babysitting. But Ms. Lancaster and I do that. We're mom. We're dad. We're granddaddy. Grandpa. We need help. Come and help us. The average military missionary right now, the average one, I'm a little above average, but the average one is 55 years old. And it's because of a lot of misconceptions. The misconception that you can't be a military missionary unless you've served in the military. That's like saying you can't be a missionary to Brazil unless you've been born in Brazil. Or you can't be a missionary to Thailand unless you've been born in Thailand. No, you can be a missionary, a, mission, a military missionary. God leads you. God empowers you. And um, come by the table. I'd like to give you an enlistment form. And we'll sign you up for our military missions. Is that okay, preacher? Just to sign them up, you know, and, and uh, we'll... We'll sign you up. Take your Bibles, if you will, please. I'll try not to be long. I, I don't want to keep you unnecessarily. And I'll try to preach in shorthand. And uh, if you'll listen real carefully. Uh, are you at Second Kings? That's where I hope I suggested that you go. Second Kings chapter 4. And we'll read a statement about Elisha. These two great giants of the faith. Somebody has said, where is the God of Elijah? Or where are our Elijahs, excuse me, waiting for somebody to trust in the God of Elijah? Or the God of Elisha? Verse 8. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8. And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem where it was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which passeth by us continually. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father, my heart has been moved, Lord. Dear Lord, my heart's been moved and it's also been grieved. I thank you, dear God, that there is one that is considering the need of the sons and daughters of America that live on a foreign field and serve in a hostile environment. But, oh, God, there's a need for so many more. I pray that you'll speak to hearts. And, dear God, now help me. I need your help, Lord. Grant that which is on my heart just now. In Jesus' name, amen. This Shunammite woman said, there's a man of God that passes by. I don't know whether you agree with me or not, but that's, uh, that is a very, very uh, profound title. I, I have been introduced down through these 46 years that I have been trying to serve the Lord full time 
I've been introduced many ways. Uh, we have Brother Lancaster to preach for us tonight, or we have Pastor Lancaster who's coming to be our speaker. And every once in a while, somebody will even say we have Dr. Lancaster. But a few years ago, I was being introduced in a place and I was sitting on the platform, chewing at the bit and ready to go. And the pastor said, we have Brother Lancaster, a man of God. And it shook me. I preached my sermon and I got along by myself. And I said, is that true? Am I a man of God? I want to be a man of God. Even more than that, I want to be what the Shunammite woman said. I want to be a holy man of God. I want to be a righteous man, a godly man. Now, in case you might think, well, what he's talking about so far is just relevant to the male gender. Well, we don't call our precious women, women of God. But I do appreciate it so much when every once in a while I'll get a note from one of our former members or one of our members will say, Brother Lancaster, thank you so much for being an example before me and my wife. And Brother Lancaster, tell Mrs. Lancaster that we are profoundly grateful for her being a godly woman. You wouldn't say woman of God, but a godly woman. And then, of course, to be able to know, rub elbows with young people who are godly young people. Young people who enjoy life, and I do. I love life. I enjoy life. But godly young people who enjoy life, but young people who have their eyes set on something that's serious and something that's worthwhile. Elijah and Elisha were men of God. I would like to suggest to you that both of them were ordinary people. The Bible says that, that they were, that Elijah was a man of like passion. He was an ordinary man. He was an ordinary man that had put his trust and faith in a great God. He was a praying man. He was a man that had confidence. Both of them were men that had confidence in the word of God. They were both men that had been put to the test and they passed the test. A lot of people don't make it that far. They fall by the wayside when the first test comes. Somebody has said, and I think it's right, if your faith cannot be tested, it cannot be trusted. They were tested men. They were not only tested men, but they were men who were committed. You remember what Elisha did. Elisha took the, the oxen and he took the, the plow and he, and he broke it up and, and they had a feast with those oxen. In other words, he burned the bridges behind him. Well, would to God that people would do that. I, I, I love the mission field. I love it. Our ministry is changing somewhat, and I've had it asked of me recently several times, Brother Lancaster, are you and Ms. Lancaster moving back to America because of the change that's going on? Heavens no. By God's grace, we're going to stay as long as we can. Where we are, there is no turning back. No turning back. In my life on the mission field, I have seen, sad to say, an army of them come and go at the first difficulty. But thank God for those that would come and see their way through the difficulties 
and stay. I also want you to notice the fact that that Elisha was recognized by this perceptive woman. She recognized the man of God. Did you know something? There is something that sets a man of God or a godly woman or a godly young person. There is something that sets them apart. Now let me just mention to you young people that are aspiring to go to the mission field. Mama's love, a Schofield Bible, your Bible certificate, a new suit and a loud mouth won't make you a missionary. It'll take something other than that. I want you to look back, if you will, please, for just a minute to 1 Kings and direct your attention, please, to, oh, about chapter 14, I think. No, let's, let's go the other way. Uh, go to, um, let's see, chapter... Uh, 19. Look at chapter 19. <laughs> and listen to this concerning Elijah. Verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under the juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under the juniper tree, behold, an angel touched him. Look, if you will, please, in verse 7, the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him. I'm a southern boy, and although I got saved a little later than I would like to have gotten saved. I've been around Southern preachers now for many, many years. And I've heard a lot of these Southern preachers talk about somebody that had something that Bible college couldn't give them and, and nothing else could give them. But here's the way they'd say it. That fellow's got the touch of God on him. And that's the way we, they'd say it touch of God. They wouldn't say touch of God. They'd say he's got the touch of God on him. Look back, if you will, please, at chapter 18 and verse 46. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. I um, got saved and, and a preacher came to our church there in Jacksonville and the pastor said is there anybody here that will volunteer to uh, drive the evangelist around from place to place I said I'll do it man I wanted to get close to that preacher and I spent time with him and towards the end of the week he said um, he said uh, Tommy you appear to me to be a young man that's really looking for the will of God. Now, I didn't, I don't know where I came out and said, you got it right, but he had it right. I wanted to know what God wanted me to do. And he said, I'm going to give you a list of 10 books that every serious Christian ought to have. He wrote them down. Within just a few months, I had every one of those 10 books. One of them was R.A. Torrey's book, The Endowment of of power from on high. Now bear in mind, I had never been to church much in my life. But I read that and I read the autobiography of Charles G. Finney and something began to burn in me. I've got to have a power that I don't have. I've got to have something that I don't have. And I began to beg God and beg God and beg God that God might fill me with his spirit. 
I began to search the scripture and find everything that I could find out about being filled with the spirit of almighty God. I had a hunger to be filled with the spirit. I wanted to have the touch of God on my life. I never will forget one of the first sermons that I preached. Brother Sexton has already mentioned that I had spent some time in the Methodist church. Somebody gave me a Bible and I became Baptist. But um, I, I, spent, uh, I spent some time in the Methodist church. And um, I had two young fellows in my church that had surrendered to preach. And being ignorant the way I was, I, I said to myself, now, these two men, they need to hear about the power of the Holy Spirit like I heard about it or read about it. And so I'm going to preach on the power of the Holy Spirit. And that morning at that Methodist church, I preached on being filled with the Spirit, ignorant as I could possibly be. But I knew that those two men needed it because they were preachers. They were going to be preachers. And I needed it, so I needed to hear my own sermon. And I gave the invitation. And when I gave the invitation, the altar was filled. And I said to myself, I said something that I don't remember saying. No many, not, not, not that many people could have come forward. I started down at that end, and there was no leather face thick hand farmer and I wrapped my arms around him and when I did I felt his old body just shaking and I said Mr. Yarbrough why did you come brother and he looked up at me and, and tears were just making their way down his old wrinkled face and he said to me indignantly and I needed it he said preacher Farmers need to be filled with the Spirit too, don't they? I said, yes, sir. I made my way down, and down at the end of the altar was my sweetheart. I took her by the hands, and I said, Dottie, why did you come right here? She said, Tommy, you need a Spirit-filled wife. And our son needs a spirit-filled mother. Would you pray for me that I'd be filled with the spirit? Let me ask you this. Have you ever thought about the need of the touch of God on your life? The power of almighty God. Now let me tell you this about being a man of God, a woman of God, a godly young person. If you are saved, are you listening to me? If you are saved, there's a man of God in there. And if you'll just get rid of the stuff, the man of God will come out. If you are a saved woman, if you'll get rid of the stuff, the godly woman will come out. If you are a saved young person, if you will get rid of the stuff, that godly young person will come out. Well, I got about 45 minutes more of things to say, but let me just, let, let, I want you to turn over, if you will, uh, to uh, turn to first Samuel chapter 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9. I'm going to beg your preacher to let me come back one of these days and preach forever. And the, now my sermons don't get any better. You know, Dr. Robertson, he can preach 15 minutes and say everything that I say in, you know, a whole week's meetings and everything. But. <laughs> You know, do you, do you know what's needed? Um, uh, somebody just raise your hand, you missionaries, uh, you, you folks that just stood up here. 
uh, I want you to raise your hand. Let me point at a couple of you, and I want you to shout it out real good uh, where you believe the Lord's leading you to. Where is it? Over here on this side. Raise your hand. Yes, young lady. Israel. Do you know what's needed in Israel? A godly woman. Or if you would like to say so, a woman of God. A godly woman. A woman that has the anointing of God, the touch of God. Who else over here? Raise your hand. Yes, honey, right there. Germany. You know what's needed there? Godly woman. What about a man over here? Any men? Any men? Raise your hand, men. Men? What, right? Okay, yes, sir. United Kingdom. Man of God. Man of God. Anybody out here in the front? Yes, sir. Right here in the front. Nicaragua. Man of God. Behind you there. Africa. Man of God. Did, did you know that the Bible teaches us, if you, if you study over there in 1 John, you'll find God's word talking about the unction and the anointing. And when the Bible talks about the unction and the anointing in 1 John, it tells us that we have no need that any man teach us. You say, well, Brother Lancaster, if that's true, I just get out of college right now. It says that if you have the anointing, you know all things. You know what that means? Listen to me real carefully. That means that a converted drunk that didn't have a daddy and a mama that ever once prayed with him, never had anything going for him, never graduated from high school, until he went back and got his GED. God can use even me if I will yield my life to him and have the touch of God on my life. And I can have the touch of God on my life if I'll get rid of the stuff. And when I get rid of the stuff, Whoop! The Holy Ghost in me will lead me where he wants me to go. And when he puts me where he wants me to go, he knows where I am and he knows what I need. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. I love you, Lord. You've been so good to this, this old boy. I love you. Help us. How many of you need to get rid of some stuff? Come on, come on, put it on the altar right now. Get up and put it on the altar right now. Name the stuff. Don't call it sin. Don't be a hypocrite and call it sin. Tell him what the sin is. God, I got stuff. And here's what my stuff is that I'm putting on the altar. God bless you, sweetheart.